thank you guys for having me. I prepared a special talk for you, um, and I titled it, An Appraiser Speaks to the Frustrated Artist, uh, A Real Look into the Art Market and Strategies for Sales. And I, I kind of thought, what, would, what, what could I bring you most of value in my world? So as an appraiser, I'm looking at value and valuation and the different elements that go into value. And then on the other side, I was thinking, well, how does that impact the working artist? So I hope that this talk helps a little bit. And you know, if you have something that you want to offer, just raise your hand and we can talk about it. Um, so here's a news flash for all of you artists out there. You are involved in what I call a dynamic tension. I would say it's an epic tension. And you might not have a name for it, but this tension exists, and it exists in your work and how you think about your work. This tension is between what you're inspired to do and what you believe will sell. The tension influences the beginning of a piece, how you make it, and how, if it's pretty, etc. The palette and the medium you choose, what you show to your friends, what you keep to yourself. And you might say, how does she know this? Well, for years, you know, I've been in the field for 40 years, and for years I do a lot of pro bono work. So artists will come into my um, office and they'll ask me about the market, et cetera. So over 40 years I've met your type many, many times. So I can hear, you know, I know what I, I'm talking about, I think. What you show your friends, what you keep for yourself, what you offer for sale, and what you offer for sale eventually. Now this tension influences how you price your work and to whom you market your work. The tension influences the galleries you choose to work with, the places you choose to show, and the mailing list you endeavor to uh, maintain. The tension may not show in the final end product of your actual painting, sculpture, or creative endeavor, but it shows in your approach to your art in your creative life. So we are here today to talk about this tension and the ways your buying public may or may not contribute to what I call the classic artist tension headache. Namely, the conflict between what you know will sell and what you hope you can wish to sell. Anybody recognize that mm -hmm. characterization? Add to this the problem of exposure of your work to the public. How much do they understand about the creative process? This is a real question. Do they care? How many drafts and false starts and errors does it take to make a finished product? They don't know this. Um, can your buying public see the struggle between what you create and the idea for a specific creation that you saw in your mind, in your mind's eye when you began the process? And again, do they care about that process? So your buying public will tell you, and I work on the other side of the fence with collectors. I work with some major collectors and major museums and boards that buy for museums, et cetera, all my career. So even the highest level connoisseur will say, I buy what I like. Have you heard that? I buy what I like. But how many of your buyers understand that their buying decision may be based on their love affair with the color blue, for example? or the right size of canvas for their room, for example? And should you care that your buying public doesn't really know about the creative tension that you may have between what you should paint or photograph or sculpt and what you need to paint or photograph or sculpt? Furthermore, should your buying public be aware that they will probably buy another predominantly blue painting at 20 by 24 that looks like the Central California coast? <laughs> because that's what they bought before. Here are some limitations that I see truly exist in the marketplace. Smaller, and this is so plebeian, but I thought these are some of the, the, the collectors that I work with, they tell me these things. Smaller size canvases and table sculptures sell better than bigger ones. Works that can be framed and hung sell better than experimental pieces. Watercolors are usually priced lower than oils. Size is what dictates value in many cases, except when a work of art becomes too large for a modest size wall, then there is an inverse price reduction. Really cutting edge work does not sell for years. Mm -hmm. Abstract work is a challenge to sell. 
Work that falls between two genres is a challenge to sell. Works that fall between two media is hard to sell. An example is a photo that looks like a painting that looks like a photo that looks like a painting or vice versa. The buying public buys a type or genre of work. So they have in their minds a genre. And that is why the big auction houses that I work with have sales that are entitled as follows. Contemporary abstract works by modern masters. That's the, the, that's the catalog title. Or recent impressionist plain air works by California artists. You see, that's the genre. The pine public buys in genre. You may think that a gallery that specializes in one type of painting will be happy to show something completely different to educate their buying clients. You may think that, but that's wrong. Um, you may think that you should give away your work to a not-for-profit auction to establish your track record. That is also wrong. You may think that a gallery has a great mailing list that will transfer over to your work and they'll have a great opening evening. That's wrong. Now you are getting a worse tension headache. <laughs> However, I'm here to offer you a few suggestions based on 40 years of working as an appraiser and speaking to artists. Here's a few things that are right about you as a member of one of the most prestigious and hardest clubs to join, a member of what I call the creative capital class. You have something very, very important to show people. You can show them how to use their eyes. But not with lectures, not with talking, but with your work. First, do your clients truly understand what you are trained to know about composition? The answer is no. Do they understand what it takes to finish a work? That's such a challenging thing because when do you say it's done? I had a great uh, mentor in painting who told me, and I tried as a young artist, I tried to paint. Somebody told me, look, you're better talking about art than painting, so just talk about it. Don't paint. Do us all a favor. So when I say, do you, do you know what it takes to fit, do your buying public know what it takes to finish a work? What I mean by that is if you overwork a piece, what it looks like. You see? So you can show them, you can show your buying public. You can, like many of my highest level artist friends, make a video of your process working on a piece. I recommend this. You can make reproductions of your sketches along the way to your finished product. You can show them the work on the wall that you are hanging for the gallery op opening took 25 years to produce and is the essence, the sum of everything you have ever looked at in your whole life. You can, you can show this. I'll, I'll tell you why a little later. You can open their eyes, your public's eyes, to just how hard it is to make a mistake in a work and then rectify it. Okay? You can let them into the creative process, and I'm suggesting you don't tell them, but you show them. So this is a digitally enlivened culture that we live in, and I would suggest you could use that to your advantage. People, when they have a gallery opening and there's a video or photos of the artist and the process on the wall, they respond to that. They will stand and look at videos and photos of the artist at work because it's unknown to them. The process is unknown to them. They might not understand what they're looking at, but they have been trained to watch. Remember the character. Chance the Gardener, played by Peter Sellers and being there, he always said, I like to watch. So do the folks to come that look at you, because you're the artist. The artist is a bit of a celebrity, and I can date that celebrity status to Warhol, because he or she is one of the few people in the world that are independent thinkers, and you don't necessarily have a boss and the boss of you is how you see. That is the envy of most people because they don't spend years as you have doing just that. Seeing, looking at things, looking at people, looking at places. So remember in your life going forward, you're a celebrity. Your work has a value because you are a modern day celebrity and 
if you want to say, well, how do you know that, Elizabeth? I'll tell you, it's because I know fame drives value. Fame does drive value. Jackie O's costume jewelry pearls sold for millions of dollars because they belong to Jackie O. Think of yourself as a celebrity because you have hung yourself, as celebrities do, in front of the public. That means you have to do what celebrities do, and I'm suggesting you could make yourself a work of art, your own self. You can make yourself an image. How do you do that? You can show people how you think about what you choose to create. You can share evidence that it is not easy to be an artist. I think you will be surprised at the reaction. Show them that a finished piece took more than the two weeks it actually took you to paint it. Show them it takes much longer, sometimes 20, 30 years. Let them see the sausage. Now, second point. How do you price a work? You turn into a business person, unfortunately. You visit other galleries where similar work is showing by similar career level artists. You then look at the prices asked on those pieces, and because it's a gallery, you cut that price in half. Okay? A gallery will always mark up double. Now, give your buying public a range of prices to pay. I say this because this is the, the key to all retail. Think about, I hate to lower the tone, but think about Target. Target offers a range of prices offered for similar things. So will an artist for various similar, uh, uh, for very similar works. So will an airline for similar seats. I mean, have you ever thought about it? Somebody up there is paying five grand and somebody's paying, what, they're, they're this far apart? But it's a range. It's a range of prices offered with a different perception level. The difference between coach and first class, as you know, is thousands of dollars. So offer your public a range of dollars to outlay for the different pieces you make. Your public will be used to paying less for smaller scale works. And that may not be composed of the top medium of the, of the art world, which is oil. So you can kind of vary that equation. So make a few other images for people to buy. And you might say, well, look, you're speaking like a capitalist, but I guess we all have to make money. You are hoping to be paid so that you can eat and buy more paint. Perhaps get over the belief that an artist should only work for his or herself. And I will say that anybody who's in a business venture would, will w wish for that great state that all you have to do is work for yourself. Because you are a celebrity, you owe it to your public to work for them, I might suggest. You have signed on to that job. Yours is the very important business of teaching people how to see. But don't tell your public. Don't tell them. Let them see how an expert in perception actually undertakes the job and the work of looking. One artist friend, I'll give you some examples. One artist friend always has 10 by 10 pieces for under 500. That's an entry level price for this particular artist I'm talking about, entry level price for his level of experience and reputation. These small works sell, they sell pretty quick and they don't take much time for him to paint, not anywhere near the time it takes for a large canvas. So he offers a selection of prices. He offers works in different media. In his case, he, oils, he, he, works, he offers prices for oils and lithography. Now, he does something I don't necessarily approve of because he pulls from his oils, he pulls giclés. This can sometimes work to the disadvantage in, of the artist in the market, but we can talk about that later. The point is this artist acts like a business per person and he offers a range of prices. His clients buy what they like and what they tell their husband they can afford. <laughs> but in fact, they are captured. Just takes one client buying one of your pieces and if they like it, they're captured by buying one piece because if they buy one, this artist and the client need to form a relationship. If the artist sells something to someone and he is present or she is present, he takes a picture of himself and the buyer, the piece and himself, and he makes an album to show folks. I understand you've got a professional photographer here and Kenji, you might enlist him his help. By the way, this artist feels he sells better if he's present at any show of his. He keeps, he keeps a list of people he sells to and he monthly sends a shot of himself and what he's working on in his studio with him at the easel. 
He makes the client, therefore, a part of the process. Now you may shake your head and you may say, oh, Elizabeth, you're just talking about marketing and therefore any artist has to make only what he can sell and his perfect match is based on past sales. Okay, that can be the case. However, what this artist friend of mine does is he, he does all that marketing stuff, the photos of his client and him buying a piece together, etc. But then he takes two to three days of his week and he paints something like a reward for himself that really inspires him and something that is difficult for most people to really buy. But this work that he does in those two, three days little vacation, that work makes him happy, it makes him struggle, and it makes him frustrated, which means he's happy. He gives himself the permission slip to make something really unique that he doesn't think anybody will necessarily buy. He never shows these pieces, I see them, but he never shows these pieces, but he does them for his own growth. Now this particular artist I'm talking about, if I told you his name, you'd know him, but he visits galleries and he sees what other artists don't see maybe necessarily. They don't have various price points across the, what, they're, what they're offering to sell. They don't necessarily show the sausage being made. They don't necessarily reach out to buyers, like I was saying, he sends this little newsletter, et cetera. And he thinks, okay, now I have done that dirty work, which is marketing, which other artists don't necessarily do, so now I'm going to do something for me. And therefore, he goes and frustrates himself by working on something he'll never sell. Some artists think that they can imbue an established genre with a new inspired voice, okay? Let's take the example of the standard Santa Barbara plain air crowd. They believe each work by a plain air artist is fantastic. And if you came along and you said to me, Elizabeth, I'm going to now paint plain air, I would say, are you going to offer a new departure into the tradition of plain air? And you may say, yes, I'm offering a new departure. I would say to you, yes, this may be the case. But for you to offer a new look at a really established genre is really difficult and it's rare to achieve success. It is difficult to revolutionize an existing genre because it's called a genre. It's called a genre because it's a genre. So to revolutionize it means it's not called a genre anymore. By all means, you should strive to put your unique voice into everything you do, but realize that sometimes your public may, may only buy what they like, and what they like is usually what they've already bought. So this is that tension headache I'm talking about. The buying public tends to buy in genres, but take heart that it takes just one different piece in anyone's collection. I mean, I've studied collector, collectors professionally and on a scholarly basis as well. One piece can turn the whole collection on its head and they will buy different pieces from then on. So it just takes one different piece from their normal genre to turn their head. It is your job to suggest to your buying public that it's okay to have eclectic walls, just like you guys do at home. Your buying public, I wager, will not have eclectic walls. Your buying public will have a theme in their decor. Until their theme is like yours, which is eclectic, it will be hard to sell them that your work is not anything like they have ever bought before and they should buy it. But that's not impossible. That's why your gallery or show will have a great mission statement. And that's why I think this collective is such an interesting thing and why I was interested in coming to talk to you because the mission statement here is show the artist in captivity and show how the sausage is being made. So a lot of you work in this, in, in this uh, environment. So you can assume a few things. You can assume that you know more about your buying public in the method of how to see. You, can, you do that by painting or imagining. Uh, I'll give you some good examples and then we're gonna get into look at some of your work. You, you know how to see because you know some basic things about work. I often, I, when I'm looking at a piece, I'm looking for these things. I'm looking, is there a leading line into the composition? I'm looking, is there primary and accent colors? I'm looking how it's cropped. I'm looking how it's framed. I'm looking at vantage points from which a viewer can enter your work. So all these are classic composition rules. 
you um, teach the public how to see by showing that the artist's hand that holds the paintbrush or camera, et cetera, is not necessarily where the artist's eyes are looking when he or she paints a particular image. You see what I mean? So if you've got a, a big vista and it's a painting of this beautiful big vista, that is the, that's the distance between the hand and the, and the paintbrush. But your eyes are miles away. Now, how does that happen? The public doesn't, they don't get it. So you're buying, your buying public is buying your experience in looking. And the way to look is an art form, which by its very definition has been much maligned by all the electronic fake eyes we call screens. And we use these fake eyes daily. Our consumption of objects that see for us is obscene and it has robbed our public of seeing for themselves. There is a way in which you, the artist, can become the devil in our visually technologically superior world. A world that is also visually illiterate, ironically enough. Most of your public will suffer from what I call visual overkill. And it is up to you to teach your public how to see because that's your business. You do this by exemplifying the gift you have in the art of seeing. And in final couple of lines of my talk, I want to say, well, Elizabeth, what is the art of seeing? Uh, I will say to you, I can sum it up in one word. It's focus. The art of seeing is focus. And it's plain and simple focus. And you guys are masters of focus. Have you ever thought that nobody else understands that the way you do? Now we have discussed a little bit about what your unique tension headache is all about. And I would be really pleased to look at some of your works. And I want to hear some specific concerns that you might have. I would like to speak to you, perhaps, if you think about these questions in your mind. Elizabeth, please tell me about trends. Please tell me about price points. Please tell me about how auctions work. And then we can open the discussion. But, um, is, are there any questions before we look at some work? Um, when a buyer is looking at a piece and telling me what they see, I tend to be quiet because I want them to create their own vision. I don't, I don't tell them what. No, I don't think words are a good thing. I was saying if I use the example of some of the really top level artists that I work with. What they're doing is they're not talking about their piece, but they're showing the process visually. So there's photos or there's a video or, or there's, there's some documentation of one artist I work with has a big sketchbook and he shows how a piece starts off this way and then metamorphosizes. So it changes the idea because the finished product is sort of, um, you know how people are really interested to go behind the scenes at the ballet? Because they see how difficult it is. And I have a little experience in that I used to dance for many years. So it's, it's really interesting. So you show a little of it, not tell it. But I like your approach. OK, well, I was a bit confused because you're, you were suggesting that your job is to teach them how to see. Yes, but not with words. OK. I have, a, I have a, an artist uh, that I counseled for years um, in San Diego, uh, the San Diego Museum of Contemporary Art was thinking about buying a work of his, and his cheapest work was twenty thousand dollars. So they sent me down there, and I was supposed to look at the work, and I was supposed to go through his receipts and see, you know, well, what kind of value range do you usually get for your work, so that I could appraise it, so the museum could have a price point to buy it, and so we could insure it. And I asked him for an artist statement or something I could take back to the board and say, you know, this is uh, what this artist has to say about the work. And he was mad at me. He said, I'm not an accountant. I'm not a poet. I'm not a novelist. I do that. You talk about it. And so it, it, this was many years ago, kind of changed the way I thought about artists actually, unless they're really good at talking about their work and they like to do it, I would say no. But the idea is to show. Because I'm suggesting that my clients, even the best connoisseurs that I work for, you know, some of my clients in Montecito that have major collections of art, I work for them and they don't really know how that painting got from A to B and why, what the process was like. 
they, they, had, they have no conception of what struggle it is to get there. So um, my thought is if you show a little bit of the sausage, not tell, but show a little bit of the sausage, I think that you'll be amazed that people have no idea. I mean, you live in this world, so you know how hard it is. And, but I don't think your buying public really knows what that vision is or how, how that comes to be. But no, I, I wouldn't suggest you stand and say, well, you see, I was doing this, blah, blah, and then I did that, blah, no. But it, this one artist that I work with, a simple album, and he just it has it out there on his main table. And, um, you know, people love to flip through it. And they're like, gosh, look at that and how he did that. And then this is where it started and it ended up here. And, wow, I never knew. I had one um, teacher tell me um, it, the thing that we should show our public is the point before, and he was a painter in oils, the point before I start to paint the brown potato in the sky. And what that means is, right, if you're working with oil and you're overworking the sky, instead of the sky, you get the brown potato because it all starts to... So if you could show your public just the jumping off point before that brown potato happens, they'd be like, oh my God, I had no idea. I had no idea. Learning when to stop was that hard. You see? So, the brown potato in the sky. I like potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> Polly. It's very hard uh, to show in a major gallery uh, for us. Uh, and uh, how uh, you have stories, how artists uh, uh, find a way to major galleries, how they break through. Because uh, we got so many rejections when we want to go and show major galleries. Yeah, so I think this town is a little challenging, probably because you know there's there there a little a lot challenging, but but there's there's some of us that come from like I was brought up in Chicago, and you know there's different levels of galleries. So there's galleries and collectives that will be the kind of they'll be happy to show your work. In this town, why I was making so much fun of the plain air artists is because you know there's always a gallery that's going to show that genre of work. But if you're doing really experimental work, I think a, a collective like this, an opening night or something in a collective like this is great. And then I think to reach out to other galleries. I mean, there's other, other ways. Uh, there, how can I explain this? So we work with a photographer who is a career photographer, marvelous man. He's in his mid-80s. And if he doesn't have a gallery show, he gets in touch with the restaurant and says, can I hang work? Or he does something where he's every so often exposing his work to the public. So I know what you're saying. This is a challenging town because there's really no platform for really interesting work, in my opinion. Yeah. So being that you have seen how this works in other places and seen the limitations of Santa Barbara and this changing world that we're in with all of this digital stuff and whatever, do you see a new path for artists for selling work? Okay, so I think the, uh, the most fascinating thing, and Mike and I were talking about this a little bit, and I was excited when he said that um, there, there was a couple people in the collective that did um, multiples, like photography or lithography, screen prints, et cetera. So anybody that does multiple work, I think there's a lot of interest coming down the pike. And um, what I mean by that is um, copyright issues. I mean copyright issues, and I mean um, in some cases major repository of visual imagery. So I did a talk for, um, it was a fascinating talk. So uh, this was, um, how many people were at that lecture, John John? There was, there was uh, I think, eight grandchildren of great photographers. So Imogen Cunningham's granddaughter was there, Ansel Adams' grandson was there, um, Edward Weston's uh, Great grandchild was there. Uh, Horace Bristol's son was there, um, and they were talking. They convened uh, this talk. They asked me to research the value of works that were sold, resold by Getty from their family estates. So that's the visual image where they generated that were being resold by Getty, and how much. Getty was selling those images for. So it calls into question the copyright issues and what's the value? 
because the Getty has this image. It's a multiple, right? So the Getty sells an image for five grand. They split it generally between the, the artist and, and um, themselves. But it's a multiple, and it's transferred to the client via computer. So there's all these problems with that. And it's, but there's also a lot of opportunity with that. So a visual collective database is a great opportunity, but there's a lot of legal and valuation issues right now with that. But technology is a double-edged sword that way, you know. Um, but are you seeing any new ways of selling, new techniques to try and sell something that breaks out of the mold of what was typical and isn't working anymore? Um, I think that that's a very good question. I think that the idea of the social, mm, uh, there's a word that I use for gallery openings in general, and it's called ritual. So there's a ritual about a gallery opening, and it's a social anthropological ritual. And I think there's a ritual, uh, ritualization that it's, par it's so much part of the art world, I don't see that changing anytime soon. So that's, that, that's a, a social platform. Um, I think this idea of a collective, not, not necessarily collective like your, yours, but that's a, this is great, but a collective where you're, you are marketing an image. So I'm thinking gen, generally John's uh, mentor, Santi Fasali, great photographer, and um, Christie's was having a, a um, they were auctioning a Warhol. It's the Warhol of um, the dollar sign in yellow with the two bars through it, and they were asking, I don't know, five mil or so, right? No big deal. But the, Santi had taken a picture of Warhol years ago standing in front of that piece. And what Christie's did was exactly what I'm suggesting in my talk to you. They took that photo, which was a master photo, and they, here's the catalog entry in Christie's catalog. Here's the Warhol. And right next to it is Santi's shot of Warhol and that image. They just made themselves a million dollars by doing that because it's reinforcing. So the images reinforce each other. So what I'm suggesting in my talk to you today is that you use imagery to reinforce a work that you're doing. Whether it be, yes, Mike, you had a question. Oh, I didn't want to just oh. finish your thought. So you, that, that's a, a way that I think if you, if you really think about technology, what's offered, and the fact that those, those, the days of here's one piece on the wall, do you like it, you can buy it if you want, or you can go away, I think those days have got to change because of the way technology is promulgating the visual imagery. I said at the end of my talk that it's obscene how much visual information we constantly have. And I think we're going to become numb from that if we don't have some clarification, which I thought was a stroke of genius, was Santi's uh, photo and then this particular canvas. And, you know, I, I watched Christie's auction. Here's, you know, do I hear four? Do I hear four? You know, and, and Here's Santi's photo on an easel right next to it. So you're, you're buying. So what I'm suggesting is the buying experience is so much about perception. And since you are masters of perception, there's other ways of using other media to, to hammer that perception home. Not talk, but other imagery. Yeah, a couple of things. One is that we actually were thinking of um, doing a thing where we would have a video of each artist and um, that uh, when people come in, they could select whoever that was depending on, because it would be on a computer, um, depending on which artist they were interested in and tap on it or click on it or whatever and see something about that person and their process and that that sort of a thing. So that's something that we have thought about and uh, that could be, uh, take a little bit of money to do, but I don't think too much actually um, with careful buying from Craigslist, et cetera, and equipment. And um, we have a so to we have a videographer that's going to help us, I understand. And uh, so I think that's that's something that, that uh, has already been thought of and I think that's something we should be follow through and do. 
Now, another question I have is... Can I comment on that? Sure. Mike? So, um, I would say that it's a, it's a great idea, but I would say instead of giving the, um, the, the gallery goer a choice, that you have a really, um, perhaps the mall has something like that, somebody who is um, a master at, um, what do I want to say, John? A master at um, a visual presentation. So, you know, they have these beautiful windows and this sort of thing. So somebody that can do a video that's in a really interesting place that does a continuous loop and is exciting and interesting. So it's not like I press on it and here's the visual imagery, but something, boom, it just hits and it's a kind of a, a main feature of the space. Right. Yeah, and it's, and it's exciting and sexy, you know, and it's maybe done in, fu in fun, um, what do you call it when you do a, like you do black and white and color and it, it's, it's vision, it, it yeah, says, it yeah, it, 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 yeah, and it's, it says we are visual right. people. Right. Yeah. Now, I'm well, just, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. I just, uh, as a follow-up to that, another thing is that uh, which I've talked to people here about and done a little bit of so far, but not too much, was something I thought of was that if we have, uh, as one of the reasons why I called it, uh, Center for Creative Arts was that if we have other sorts of artistic events here, uh, <coughs> such as we had some one act plays here on Monday, or I guess it was last Monday, and um, you know some things of that sort, that that would help to build, let's say, the reputation of the galleries, and this is the place to go, this is the place to be, etc. That that would ultimately as time goes on, enhance the value of the artists who are here. Yes, what yes. Do you think? I think it's a great idea, and it goes to my comment that um, I, I once wrote a, 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 a piece I was really proud of, um, making a case for a ritual studies department. So it was a religious studies department. And I, I said, you know, the going to a museum and the going to a gallery is just as much of a ritual as many religious experiences. Mm -hmm. And I did a study on that. Mm -hmm. And so it's based on that social bond mm -hmm. and that we're all doing this together. We're experiencing something as this bond together. And it's a ritual. So the more you can, I think, underpin the idea of the ritual the social ritual with the artist as shaman. Mm -hmm. I think that that would be super exciting. Yeah. As far as efforts being put in, sort of like between those ideas, because there's you know only so much time in a day. Right? Yeah. So, where would you suggest that we start with? Would you suggest that we put more of our energies into creating a video to display in the rooms about our our work? Would you suggest that we? Um, concentrate more on bringing in more different variety of artists to, you know, to round out our, like, where would you suggest that we put the primary bulk of our, of our efforts into, to oh, start? Oh, Lord. <laughs> what, would, what would help benefit us originally to, you know, I mean, like, as a balance, as we can tackle them all a little bit at a time, but where do we put the strongest focus? I think I'd have to rely on um, my business background to answer that, and I would say, if you had a, a pretty good sense of the, the amount, oh, how many attendees show up for this? How many attendees show up if you did a public lecture or if you did a scholarship course for children? Or, how, you know, to actually try a few things and see what, what captures the public. So I know that um, your opening, I think, was very popular. And so it was a, you know, how, what, what were the elements that made that click? And then re, remake that you know, kind of thing, and then try something new. But I would say it's not a reinvention of the wheel, but to actually study other collectives and how they do it and what they do. I know Mike told a story to me of going to London and seeing that this collective worked in London, so why don't we try it here in Santa Barbara? So what are the other collectives doing? You know, what, what are they, what's at Bergamon Station? You know, what's, uh, all these places that have artist collectives, what do they do? I think, you know, as far as uh, my clients are concerned, so people that collect paintings that hire me, I think that they would be really interested in knowing um, 
how an auction works, for example. So if you were to say, if you were to do an auction mm -hmm. and have a, an auctioneer that actually worked with pieces and this sort of thing, so it's exciting, it doesn't have to be with real money, but just the process, because that's another ritual in the art world, which is the, the auction. You know, something that's like this, and you know, you may, you may want to at one point convene a board of people that have some experience in the art world like myself, maybe a, um, a, a gallery owner, it, like a consulting mm -hmm. board where we would get together and I would say, I, I can definitely do an auction. Or somebody would say, I can definitely offer my gallery one month a, a, a weekend. Do you know what something like that would cost us? Well, I, this would be a board, so you'd have to, you know, people like me, I would volunteer to be on your board, et cetera, and you know, it, the thing is, I, so, let me give you also a little insight onto how boards work, which is really interesting. So I've been on boards for theaters and ballet companies and, and, and uh, museums. So when you're on a board, you are expected to give either money or time or your expertise back to the board. So it doesn't cost, but you are expected to do that. So you know that that might be an idea. I mean, I'm just blue sky in here because I don't know your organization. What about but more roller skates. <laughs> more roller skates. Oh, yeah. Why not, Polly? How can we bring the relatively unknown artist a painting to an auction? Yeah. So I'm suggesting you have your own auction. So not, I couldn't call Christie's for you and say, the, the problem, so, well, see the problem, the, so the problem is with auction, any of the major auction houses and even some of the smaller ones like John Moran and Clars and the smaller, unless you have a track record, unless I as an appraiser can find a track record of your sales, they're not interested because that's the catch 22. Well, they don't have a track record with the auction house. I know, because they're trying to get a track record. But Dr. Stewart, they don't have a track record with an auction house. I know, because they're trying to get a track record. So it goes like this. It's, it, it, it's, it's a circle. Evil. It's an evil circle. Uh, that sort of gives me an idea of, 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 of an event, which will probably get rejected by everybody. But <laughs> like it, 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 would be kind of, it would be kind of fun. Uh, and that is, uh, remember there's that, uh, there's that uh, movie, cartoon movie, Frozen, yeah. and there's a uh, character in it called Kristoff. And we could make like Kristoff's, instead of Christie's, be Kristoff's. <laughs> <laughs> and use that character in the promotion. Well, that'll go well when they sue us for using that. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that later. We'll never find that. So I have another question. Well, mm -hmm. Great idea. Um, and so, We've talked a lot about paintings and about photography, and obviously mm -hmm. the hardest artwork to sell is three-dimensional. Yes, so sculpture. So sculpture is my thing. So um, how would you suggest that that market gets entered into and is seen differently? Because I know it's much easier to put a piece up on the wall, and I wish I did that, but I don't. So. Can you give us a little bit, because there's a few of us here that yeah. are actual three-dimensional artists. Yeah, okay, so with three-dimensional work, I think the challenge is size. Size. I really do. I think the challenge is size, because my collectors that I appraise for, they will have a sculpture, you know, on a plinth, and it'll be like so, or they'll have something in the bookcase like so. Or they'll do, uh, one has beautiful jewelry. I noticed you do jewelry, and she has jewelry that is a sculptural piece. Nevelson, actually, she's got a Nevelson piece. Yeah, so there are, there's, like I suggested in my talk, to do a range. So there's a range of sizes, there's a range of price points, so that people can do a starter uh, of your name and start that. It, the other thing is, this town likes public art. But they only like a type of public art, and I know. and so sculptors generally try to do a public art commission, and that's a challenge here. But there are opportunities for public art with sculpture, in other places. We, um, uh, I worked at the at a, a hotel in San Diego. They were selling it. They sold it to a, um, a certain organization, and that organization wanted to do a lot of sculpture, and we commissioned a lot of work at that time 
So there's organizations that want a public something or other that isn't public that they're actually paying for. It's hard to find that out, but and it's difficult in this town. But I, my my suggestion is size. Mm -hmm. well, that's what I size. So keeping it small is yeah. You, what you're moderate. suggesting moderate size. Moderate, yeah, Not huge. yeah. I mean, because the only your really top end sculpture connoisseur is gonna really have a, a, a four foot to six foot to eight foot piece. And the exception is if you've got a top flight gardener, landscape architect, who's commissioning you to do a landscape piece for their client's garden. Yeah. And we run into that too as appraisers, we, we see that. Mm -hmm. So, but here again, it's sort of like, how do you make that connection? I think, Andy, Andy you, had a, you, had a, you had a question. <clears throat> Which may have uh, this was going escaped. Back, uh, this was going back uh, to the video pieces of um, each artist. Could, would it be uh, right to say it's almost like a mini commercial that we're creating? For Sadly. Yeah. Okay. So something like 30 yeah. seconds to a minute, boom, then you loop. Loop. Yeah. It's just pretty, it. it's pretty amazing to see. Um, so I, every year I had clients that sent me to Art Basel in Miami Beach. They were using me to buy pieces there. And I'd stand there and, you know, pieces going for a mill, two mills, something like this. And I'd stand there and the artist would have his video looping and people would be like, amazed. I'm like, that's his work. Why don't you look at his work? They, you know, they were looking at the video. You know, we're, we're trained to look at that because we look at it all day long on our phones, our computers, et cetera. So we're looking at the video. And they're, I mean, they're looking at the video right past the work. Wow. Well, the thing is, for sure, is that if, assuming if we do it here, done correctly and with the right angle to it, it would make it appear to the buyer that you, wherever you are, is an artist that they should get. It's because that's and the tradition. Yeah. The celebrities are always on a video. We're used to that. We see YouTube right. all the time. Right. And, so, and done, done correctly, I think it would perfectly do. Right. So the object would be make it appear like you are an artist that they should get involved with. So this is what I say about the, the, the ritual of buying work and the ritualization and the, the anthropology of it and the perception and the psychology of it. It's, it's much more than meets the eye. Should we look at some pieces? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, well, um, uh, can I say one? one yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> I know this one. Who are we here to listen to? No. Yeah, 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 I know that. I know that. But just an example, and it goes back to this creative tension thing that you mentioned at the beginning. And it might be slightly different from what you were saying, but um, just my experience. Uh, and and uh, the general one would the other thing that I do, but a more recent one also that goes along with it. I told most of you um, when we first were having meetings that my way of looking at what I do in normal life is I don't care how many of them they sell, I don't care how many of them sell, I only care that they're the best that they possibly can be. Now, we had a new thing I was thinking of that I wanted to do, and, and they became very successful recognize the best in the world. And uh, we had a new thing I got the idea for a few months ago that was an outrageously expensive thing of this thing that yeah, I thought, I, you know, it was like, I have no idea if anybody's ever gonna buy this thing, you know? But I knew it would be an incredible thing, the best, it, even better than what's ever been out there. And so uh, I said, okay, great, I'll pay for it to make them. We did. And, uh, we put them on the website about a week or so ago on Saturday, and by Monday, completely sold out. Way outside of the box of what normally would ever sell, but people instantly just recognize this is something. So, while there is that tension, I would shade it on the side of do what you really think is the thing that that uh, that really expresses that thing that you want to do. Because if you hit 
that thing that is really you, that is going to communicate forcefully to that person who is seeing it. And it may not be, really it, 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 I would say that the, the history, now, art is a kind of different from another kind of commodity, and I'll just play devil's advocate and say, if yes, you can do that, but there's two problems in it, is knowing that that is finished, because right. the quest for perfection is always there, and right. also having the hopes that it will sell in 50 years or less. Because if it's, <laughs> yeah, because it, yeah. the issue is if it's really forward work, it takes a long time for the world to catch up. Well, I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying it's super forward and super uh, never, yeah. you know, some oddball way out there. No, no, the not fire. oddball. I'm just saying yeah. that whatever it is that you do, if it's going to be like this, that it is the thing that expresses you the best. So, so, so that's yet. We try and put our best. Them. Yeah, that's right. So that's what they tell me. So that's what we do all the time. I mean, that's yeah, the point of the art. We don't do it for someone else. We do it because it's our essence that's, going out yeah. in that world. So that's the tension I'm talking about yeah. is, is yeah. that, yeah. yeah. So, but the, I, I will say one other thing. So to be also devil's advocate and speak about art as a business, which is the other side of my career, I would say a way to actually make that experiment pop is remember I'm saying you do a range of, of pieces and ranges of sizes, range of value, and then have one piece that's $50,000. And you say, look, you know, and you're using that as a contrast. You know, you're like, for example, you flip through a rack at the Goodwill, oh, that's $5, that's too expensive. You flip through a rack at what, a high-end ladies store? You know, it's like, oh, you know. What's wrong with that? No, no, it's like, oh, that's 50 bucks. That's too cheap, yeah. right? So it works both ways. There's a lot of economic theory about that. There's the Verblen theory. There's why you buy a Louis Vuitton bag that's plastic for $800. How does that work? Mm -hmm. You see? Mm -hmm. A lot of it is percent. But a lot of people use that to price one work super high and then do a number of things that, you know, wow, look at this bargain. People. <laughs>